Well, thanks for that introduction, Scott, and thanks to the Sabre community at large for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, in 2014, Major League Baseball unveiled StatCast, its data collection and reporting system. In StatCast's first full season, it was estimated that the amount of data publicly available from that single season was more than the amount of data that had previously been collected in the entire history of the game. Each year, with baseball's continued introduction of new technologies such as Hawkeye, this trend toward more and more data accelerates. So the challenge everyone in the baseball world is facing now is how can we use this data to provide insight and to help with our decision-making process? So we're gonna borrow some AI techniques called deep learning and neural networks that have been transforming fields like computer vision, speech recognition, and game playing and apply them to baseball. If you've ever talked to a voice assistant like Siri or Google Voice, or you've been in a self-driving car, you've already experienced some of the ways that this technology is being applied. I previously worked on the software behind Amazon's Alexa voice assistant. And my goal when I started Singularity was to see if these AI technologies, which are revolutionizing a bunch of different areas in Silicon Valley can be applied to sports. My co-author in this paper is Tate Huffman, a senior at Harvard majoring in applied math and economics and a member of the Harvard Sports Analysis Collective. So before we get started, a few quick acknowledgements of groups and people that have helped us along the way. So a quick overview of today's talk. We're gonna start with a description of how we use AI to improve predictions in baseball and compare our results to more traditional methods. We're gonna talk about explainability, which means making the rationale for our predictions understandable to humans. And we're gonna talk about some of the interesting strategies uh, that can be built upon these predictions, which Tate Huffman uh, implemented and shared via open source software and tools. So while our approach can be generalized, the problem that we tackled first was to predict the outcome of a plate appearance. And plate appearance predictions affect many decisions in baseball. Everything from determining batting order to selecting pinch hitters or relief pitchers, uh, deciding what day to rest a player and, and much, much more. So in this example, which is drawn from 2019, we have Aaron Judge of the Yankees facing Wade Miley of the Astros. And so what are some of the things that we might wanna predict here? Uh, certainly if you're the Astros, you might wanna get predictions um, on some of your favorite stats like on-base percentage or WOBA. And these might be useful in deciding, for instance, uh, whether I bring in a relief pitcher and if I bring in a relief pitcher, who should I bring in? But I might wanna also get predictions for individual events. Uh, there's a man on first here. So maybe if I'm the Astros again, I might wanna know the probabilities that my different pitchers can induce a double play. So what do I need to actually make the prediction? So any decent model will of course take into account the pitcher stats and the batter stats. But of course, even the casual fan knows that there's much more to it than that. Uh, so this matchup is a lefty versus a righty. So that's favorable historically, at least to, uh, to the batter. Um, it's also played at Yankee Stadium, which is a, which is a slightly hitter friendly stadium. Um, we know weather affects things. Uh, and Wade Miley is getting up there in pitch count. He's at 75 uh, pitches here. So again, that's typically bad news for the pitcher. So it's easy to get overwhelmed by the complexity of this problem. And we haven't even gotten to stats like batter exit velocity or ground ball to fly ball ratios and many, many other things. So what we'd really like here is a holistic solution that can look at all of this information and figure out what's important and just how to blend it all together. So let's talk about one previous uh, attempt, which is well known, which is called log five. Uh, log5 was originally developed by Bill James, and Log5 uses the batter stats, the pitcher stats, and the league average stats to determine outcome probabilities. Um, and while it sort of works, it's got some limitations. Um, one limitation is that it really only performs decently on mat matchups between everyday players, uh, which typically means a starting pitcher facing a batter who's regularly in the starting lineup. Um, and it turns out the vast majority of plate appearances, in fact, over 80%, uh, do not occur between an everyday batter and a starting pitcher. Secondly, we just talked about all the important things that uh, we already know affected in outcomes, things like platoon effects and pitch counts and park factors. And while various people have attempted to shoehorn some of these things into log five, uh, they're really band-aids. And finally, even extensions to log five only predict a limited type 
uh, a limited number of output types um, because predicting outs like uh, double plays or sacrifice flies really requires a deeper understanding of the game. So let's turn to a different approach, uh, which is something called uh, deep learning or neural networks. And the reason it's called a neural network is that the way it calculates things mimics the process that's done in the human brain. So the basic idea is that like any other model, it's going to do input to output mapping. So for instance, the input could be your income, your credit score and the type of loan you'd like to take out. And the output could be the probability that you're gonna default on the loan. And the way a neural network is trained is that you give it a lot of data containing different input output combinations and the neural network learns what's important. And implementation wise, what's happening behind the scenes during the training phases is that, these, um, that the weights of these edges are being adjusted. And it turns out that once you finalize these edge weights, given any input, you can produce an output. And what makes neural networks particularly powerful is that the neural network is able to discover really subtle relationships in the data. Um, but one key thing to know about neural networks is that they have a voracious appetite for data. Uh, and fortunately in baseball, we have access to more data than we've really previously been able to handle. So let's bring it back to baseball now and let's see how we can use this technique um, for baseball to predict the outcome of plate appearance. And to do that, we created a model called Singularity PA where the, where the PA stands for plate appearance. Uh, we have a neural network here where our inputs are the pieces that we decided are important in order to predict outcomes. And our outputs are the different things we'd like to predict. Uh, so in our case, our outputs are one of 21 different types of plate appearance outcomes that Major League Baseball has defined as official outputs of a plate appearance. So some examples of the outputs are walks, home runs, force outs, um, and the neural network generates probabilities for each of these 21 different outputs. Um, and from those 21 different outcomes, we can then calculate expected aggregate stats like batting average or WOBA. So to train the neural network, uh, we use StatCast data from 2011 through 2020, uh, which consisted of over 1.7 million plate appearances. And we held back 20% of the data and we used that final 20% of the data at the end to measure how well the neural network had actually learned to predict things. So let's look a little bit more closely at the inputs that we use to make a prediction. We've got 14 inputs for the batter and pitcher historical data respectively. Uh, and these are 365 day moving average averages. So some examples of the 14 inputs would be number of plate appearances in the last 365 days, and then a bunch of things related to rate per plate appearance. So singles per plate appearance, home run per plate appearance, walks and strikeouts per plate appearance. Uh, we also have nine inputs for the batter and pitcher's recent statistics in which we use a 21 day uh, moving average. We also have batter and pitcher head to head uh, uh, statistics, which, which includes statistics about how often they faced each other in the last three years and, what they, and what's happened during those at-bats. So how important is head-to-head? -head? This is somewhat controversial. Well, what we're gonna do is just provide the raw stats to the neural network and let it figure out how to weigh head-to-head -head stats uh, against all the other inputs uh, that are available. So there's also a bunch more here, including park factors, platoon stats, score, uh, as well as some of the more advanced stats like batter's exit velocity and ground ball to fly ball ratios. So let's revisit that at bat now of Aaron Judge versus Wade Miley and look at what's predicted. So on the top portion of the graph, you can see some aggregated predictions. Um, for instance, you can see that the expected batting average here is 308 and the expected WOBA is a little over 380. And on the bottom portion of the graph, you can see the probabilities for 21 different types of outcomes for the plate appearance. So for instance, you can see that Aaron Judge has a 22% chance of striking out and a 5.5% chance of hitting a home run. Um, notice also that we now have predictions for a double play in fielder's choice here. Um, so the predictions are much more specific than just an out. And in case you want more visual proof that the neural network understands the rules and strategies of the game, let's look at an animation. Um, so if you look at the top left corner of this graph, you can see the same at bat, but now we're gonna cycle through all the different base out combinations and look at how the probabilities change. So notice not, uh, not just the rules of the game are understood. Um, so for instance, double plays uh, will only occur when there are runners on base with less than two outs, but also some of the strategies. So for instance, it understands that walk probabilities vary depending on the outs and the base runners. 
So now that we know at least visually that the predictions seem to make sense, let's get some measurements about the quality of our predictions. And to do that, we compared the results of our predictions to those of log five, as well as to a very simplistic model we called league average, where we assume the probabilities of the 21 outputs um, just really followed league averages exactly. And we see that our model performs better than both log five and league average. Um, and this is good news. We've got a much more sophisticated and complicated model and it should perform better than those models. Um, and now let's break down those predictions a little more. Um, if you remember from our discussion about log five, we said that log five is really only geared toward predictions between everyday players. So let's see how our model in log five and league average perform against everyday players. And for the 18% of plate appearances that do feature everyday players, log five does marginally better than league average. Um, and our model does significantly better than both models. And as you get matchups between players who are used um, less and less frequently, log five does really start to break down and our model is still able to, to outperform the other models. Okay, so now let's move on to the concept of explainability. Um, as you probably have heard many times in school, you only get partial credit for getting the right answer. You need to show your work to get full, to get full credit. And so we're gonna apply that same uh, idea here. And so first of all, I wanna emphasize that you've probably actually seen this concept of explainability before. If you've ever asked for your credit report, you'll get something that looks like this. Um, and you'll see that along with your credit, your credit score, you'll get a list of the most important things that are affecting your credit. Um, so down here, you see your credit score is dropped because you've got too many inquiries on the, on the credit report, ironic. Um, so credit scoring companies are investing a lot of resources around making credit predictions as accurate as possible, which means at times building very sophisticated models, but their scoring methodology can't be completely opaque. So a good definition of explainability is that we wanna make the rationale behind the predictions understandable to humans. And so why is that important? Well, the first is, is trust. Ultimately, it's humans that must make and defend the decisions based on the predictions of the model. So in baseball, if your model tells you to pull a pitcher, for instance, you need to have some rational way to explain that to the players involved, to other management and to the press. The second is insight and learning. Um, humans also often have a mental model of how things work. And if you can make your model explainable, it can help people to update this model in their heads. And the third is debugability. Um, sometimes your model will produce wacky results. So in the computer vision world, it can be something dangerous like a self-driving car not recognizing a stop sign. So you wanna understand how your model came to its conclusion uh, so you can fix things. And one of the earlier criticisms of AI and in particular neural networks was that they're black boxes. So some, unlike a, a simple equation that's easy to both compute and explain, the workings of a neural network are contained in those thousands and thousands of edge weights that the neural network has learned. And so for a long time, there's been this tension and this trade-off between a model's accuracy and its explainability. And it was thought that if you wanted a model which was accurate, it couldn't be explainable and vice versa. And then about four or five years ago, some researchers at the University of Washington made a, a real breakthrough which was to take an old idea in economics and game theory and find efficient ways uh, to apply it to artificial intelligence to make opaque AI models explainable. And that idea was the concept of Shapley values. And Shapley values were actually an old concept which was invented in 1953 by Lloyd Shapley. And he actually later won a Nobel Prize in economics for this work. And what Shapley values are able to do is to look inside a black box and ask how much do different inputs contribute to the ultimate prediction. So let's bring it back to baseball now and let's return to that uh, at bat between Aaron Judge and Wade Miley and look at how we can use Shapley values uh, to explain the prediction. So if you remember from earlier in the talk, it was predicted that this WOBA was, would have a expected uh, WOBA of a little over 380. Um, so let's try to understand this graph and explain how we got that prediction. So if you start from the bottom of the graph, you'll see that we start from a, uh, a WOBA value of a little over 310, um, which is the league average WOBA. And we end up with a prediction of just over 380. So what caused that? Well, the Shapley value is gonna uh, describe the marginal contributions of the inputs that moved our prediction from 310 to 380. So let's read this graph from the bottom up and look at a few of the different inputs. 
So we see that picture historical moves things. So this is uh, Wade Miley's last 365 days of stats, but it just moves things by a tad. Um, does that mean pitcher's historical stats aren't important for predicting WOBA? No, it just means that Wade Miley has pretty typical stats over the last 365 days, and it doesn't move the needle too far one way or the other. We see that Aaron Judge is heavily dinged for his recent stats. And, and why is that? Um, so the answer is that this is Aaron Judge's first game back after spending two months on the IL. He's had a total of, of four plate appearances in the last 21 days, and the model has decided to drop his predicted WOBA based on that. And then finally, we see the lefty-righty platoon matchup and Wade Miley's pitch count of 75 are the two most important factors here and drive the predicted WOBA much higher. So we've seen what inputs are the most important factors in one instance of an at-bat, but what if we wanna know what inputs are the most important factors in general? Suppose we wanna know, for instance, how important pitch count is to predicting WOBA, or maybe I wanna understand the importance of head-to-head -head history between a batter and a pitcher, not for a particular at-bat, but just in general. And one way to do that is to sample a bunch of those predictions and plot the importance of uh, a feature for each of those predictions. So in this graph, we did that for WOBA predictions and each dot on this graph represents the importance <clears throat> of a particular feature for a particular plate appearance. So you'll see that as expected, the most important features uh, for WOBA prediction are the batters and pitchers uh, uh, historical stats follow closely um, uh, actually. And then the, the fourth most important factor here is park factor and you've got these dots hanging out there on the right, and which are, which are curious. And what's happening there, I suspect, is these are games played at Coors Field, which is a very, very hitter-friendly park. So it's also possible to show feature importance for different types of predictions as well. So for instance, here we see strikeout predictions uh, are heavily affected. In fact, the fourth most important factor here is pitch count. So now let's move on to using Singularity PA to build more complex strategies. Um, so it's important to build accurate models, but what we're really trying to do at the end of the day is to make decisions and generate wins. So let's use the National League starting lineup in the 2019 All-Star Game to ask and answer some of the types of questions we might be interested in. So, so shown in this slide is the National League batting order along with the player statistics through that point in the year. We, we might wanna know, for instance, um, how many runs the National League is expected to score against Verlander in the first inning. We, we might wonder, is this the optimal lineup? Um, let's suppose this is an extra inning game and we're playing with 2021 rules and we ask, with Freddie Freeman leading off with a runner already on second, which pitcher should I bring in to hold the National League scoreless for the rest of the inning? So there's also some questions we might wanna ask related to fantasy sports and betting. So one of the things that uh, many of those questions have in common is that we're trying to predict runs scored. And there's been some previous work done in this field. The most well-known of these is called RE24, uh, which predicts the runs scored through the end of the half inning. So for example, if you start with one out and runners on first and third, on average, you'll score 1.219 runs. Um, but RE24 is independent of any notion of who the pitchers are, who the batters are, and of course, all that other information that we just talked about. So it'll predict the same run expectation regardless of whether the pitcher is facing an all-star lineup at, at Coors Field or a bunch of re uh, recent minor league call-ups. So there have been some attempts to improve RE24 by taking into account things such as the, as the ballpark or the current batter, but these have been uh, piecemeal and really don't solve this problem holistically. So let's see if we can do better. So to do so, my co-author Tate built a Markov chain model and Markov chains are not new to baseball. In fact, there was a great talk uh, at this conference yesterday by Connor Turner entirely on Markov chains. Um, and what our Markov chain does is it builds a matrix where each cell of the matrix represents one of the 24 different base out states of an inning. Um, and so if you start with the state with no runners on base, no outs, which is shown here in the top left corner, you can use the, the predictions that Singularity PI generates to determine the probability that you go to any other of the other 24 states. And you can continue to build up this probability matrix um, to build a model of what's likely to happen for the half inning. 
And the, the problem is that until now, markup chains for baseball were not very accurate because it was really difficult to accurately generate these transition prob uh, probabilities. So the baseball markup chain model that Tate has written has been released as open source software written in R. Uh, so if you wanna take a look and play with it or use it, um, maybe with your, even with your own types of predictions, you can feel free to do that. Uh, there's a link at the end of this presentation. It's uh, really an impressive uh, and complex piece of, piece of software. Um, so let's see if we can actually use that to generate uh, better predictions. So the experiment we did was to look at run scored during the first inning over the last four years. And we used the first inning because it avoided complications around relief pitchers and pinch hitters, which we'll handle eventually, um, but which certainly make things more complicated. And we looked at the first uh, inning plate appearances and we asked how many runs were actually scored through the half inning, starting with that plate appearance. And we compared it with the predictions from RE24 and the predictions that we generated using singularity and Markov chains. Um, and the first results we found out were actually pretty disappointing. Um, we found out that we found that singularity Markov actually performed worse than RE24. Um, and we found that it was consistently underproducing or underpredicting run scored. And when we look more carefully into this, we realized that um, there's things that happen during the game that aren't captured in a plate appearance outcome. And by and large, these things favor the offense. So these are things like wild pitches, stolen bases, and movement of runners during outs. So we took a very simplistic approach, which was to simply say, uh, we realize we're missing some proportion, some proportion of offense each year. So let's just increase our predictions by how much we undershot the previous year. Uh, and we called that, that model singularity Markov adjusted. And now we find that we have a prediction system that's able to outperform RE24. And the, the, the key part is that our prediction system takes into account all these other factors now, like batters, pitchers, ballpark, and all the other factors that really matter. So let's uh, put that system to use to optimize the batting order for the National League All-Star uh, All -Star team. And uh, we show the predictions for each National League batter against Justin Verlander in the, in the middle graph. Um, so we used Singularity Markov and we iterated through all nine factorial batting orders um, and generated predictions in terms of runs scored for each of those batting orders. And it turns out you can do this in about one hour on a modern laptop. And we found a batting order which is predicted to generate 6.7 more runs in the first inning than the actual lineup that was selected by the manager. So what's next? Uh, on the neural network side, we wanna continue to use additional inputs. We wanna start including minor league stats, start taking speed into account, start using field and quality. And on the Markov side, we wanna look at how we can model the game beyond half innings. Um, can we predict when relief pitchers and pinch hitters will come into the game? And can we build models and strategies which take that into account? And if we wanna talk really futuristic, can we start to build AIs which now play different strategies against each other? Uh, importantly, I think we've demonstrated that neural networks are a powerful new tool to sift through massive amounts of baseball data and come up with new insights. Uh, with Singularity, we've built the engine and the platform to ingest baseball data and create deep learning models. And we want to start looking at other problems, uh, such as long-term predictions of uh, player performance or projection of player injuries. And then finally, and this is the part that I'm actually most excited about, uh, we built Singularity with the goal to make advanced AI accessible to anyone. So I wanna leave you with uh, three different ways you can try things out. Um, first, you can demo your own batter versus pitcher matchups on the web. Um, secondly, you can programmatically integrate Singularity predictions using either R or Python code. And third, you can either use, view, or modify our Markov chain code, which has been open sourced. I hope you'll try it out. And with that, I'm gonna unshare my screen and I can have a few minutes for Q&A. Just give me one moment. All right, I'm trying to find the Q&A. Just on the bottom of your Zoom window dashboard there, Joshua. Okay, I think I see it, Q&A. Uh, okay, 
a couple of questions on your neural network. How did you choose the number of layers and nodes uh, per layer? Did you use dropout? Yeah, uh, great question. So um, basically a lot of experimentation, um, a lot of hours on uh, eating up uh, AWS uh, credits. Um, one of the things that I found was, um, I think as has been sort of verified by a lot of research in this area is um, things like hidden layers don't make a ton of difference. Um, the input is much more valuable in terms of getting better predictions than the actual architecture of um, things like hidden layers. Uh, okay, for batter and pitcher recent input stats, why did you choose the last 21 days? Did you try the last 20, 28 or the last 14 perhaps? Is there a specific reason you chose uh, 21 days? Um, tried a few things, um, basically, was just limited by how many different things I could try. Um, I suspect you could get marginally better results if you had additional things in there. So maybe looking at things like three-year averages uh, would, be, would be useful as well. Why does the batter's fielding position have so many inputs uh, where it's, it's 10 inputs? Um, so this is just the way we ended up doing what's called one hot encoding. So it's the nine position players Plus the um, plus the DH. Uh, that's how we got ten inputs. So it's so it's just one of those that's selected. Uh, about the twenty percent of of Statcast data being held back is the eighty percent of the training going to the training data set, and is that typical for AI? Yeah, I, this is sort of a best practices thing that's been done before, which is that you use sixty percent of the da data for training. 20% for sort of tweaking your architecture. And then the final 20% um, you've never seen before. And then you plug it in and generate your results. Uh, are there any inputs that address recent injury information? I either, could there be some uh, interaction between recent shoulder injuries and pitch counts? Uh, we didn't take into account injury information. Um, again, I think there's many, many things that we could continue to add to our inputs. And the goal would be that the neural network would find out interesting relationships to this. Um, so we're really just scratching the surface in terms of the inputs. Uh, okay, does Singularity PA go by pitch count? For example, can you predict the outcomes when it's a 3-1 count compared to a 0-0 uh, zero, zero count? Um, so we just did on a, um, on a complete uh, plate appearance. So we don't do sort of inter at bat or intra at bat um, predictions. Uh, I will say the presentation yesterday on markup chains, I think, uh, did exactly that. So um, if you haven't seen that, that would be great to look at. Uh, what kind of code programs did you use to create this neural network? Um, so uh, so there's a bunch of stuff out there. I used uh, TensorFlow um, and Python on the back end. Um, how did you deal with the Markov chain matrix not being stochastic? Um, we essentially assumed that it was stochastic. <laughs> That's how we dealt with it. Um, uh, for the Markov chain, how is the pitch count updated with each transition? Um, so what we did there is we just made some simplifying uh, assumptions. So we assumed that there was a addition of five pitches uh, per each batter that went, uh, that went along there. Okay, so Scott, uh, I think I'm just about out of time, so I'll hand it back to you.